open repositories. And I, um, I will uh, manage uh, question and answers as as we go and, and mostly at the end of this um, chat. So this panel, so um, it's, uh, I'll just draw your attention to my screen where um, this is the, the schedule for the day. And um, uh, we're at our 3 um, p.m. Uh, UTC panel now. And then after this, there's two set, two parallel tracks. There's a, um, a of presentations and the links for those are in SCED. So if you're looking for that, that's where to find them. Um, I would also like to um, just thank our sponsors again. Uh, you know, even online conferences take a lot of time and effort um, and uh, these sponsors have contributed uh, resources so that uh, we can make that possible. So um, it's now uh, my pleasure to introduce um, Kathleen Shear, who is the executive director of CORE and who has put together a wonderful panel um, for us today. Kathleen, I will hand it over to you. Thanks very much, Lila. And thanks everybody for coming to attend our panel. I'm going to put up a few slides. We're not, we don't have a lot of slides today. Let me just share my screen here. and confirm that you can see my slides. Yes. Okay, great, great. Yes, yeah, so, so welcome everyone um, uh, to our panel, Speaking Up and Speaking Out, Who Will Define the Narrative for Open Access Repositories? And as people are, are coming in, I'd like to invite you to go to the menti.com site um, we have a we have um, we're just polling people to see where you're coming from, where you are based. Um, so I'm going to kind of toggle back and forth between my slides here and and the Mentimeter slides. Um, so please go to the menti.com and enter in the code, which I can't see because of this. Okay, the code three five one two zero eight six one, and and let us know what what area of, of the world you're from and so today um, the agenda for this panel is that i'm going to give a very brief introduction um, we will have the panelists our three panelists make statements which will last about 20 minutes and then we'll have a kind of a discussion so any questions you have for the panelists after their statements, that's when we will um, address those questions or comments that you have. And then we will move to the Mentimeter slides where, where I have some further questions so I can get more um, input from, from all of you. So um, just to set the scene a little bit, and I think our keynote speaker did a very good job of setting the scene for us. Um, COVID-19 has really placed open scholarship and, and open science very high on the agenda of, of governments and the research community writ large. And uh, as he said, it's a, it's a horrible um, a tragedy for, for the whole world what has happened with COVID-19, but if there's one positive outcome, it is that um, there's a, greater, a much greater awareness of the need for sharing the res results of research rapidly and openly. Um, we're also seeing a growing number of kind of more repository friendly policies, I should say. So um, we have Johan here um, who represents Plan S and they have adopted a very strong rights retention strategy um, and many other um, national uh, open access policies and open science policies clearly um, uh, situate repositories as key for, for um, implementation of those policies. And, and also very recently, we've had um, UNESCO draft recommendations, very strong UNESCO draft recommendations that were published. This was a process um, of uh, member countries uh, representatives going through an early draft 
And um, it was a very consultative process that happened over, I think it was four days, very intensive. And this is these draft recommendations are, in, are, are incredible. They're very, shall we say, um, repository friendly in the sense that they emphasize not just the importance of open, but the importance of the need for equity and biblio, supporting bibliodiversity in scholarly communications. So I'd really recommend any of you who haven't gone through the recommendations yet to, 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 to go through them. Um, there's a final step. Um, they need to be ratified at the UNESCO General Assembly in November, but given that there was um, uh, over 100 member countries that participated in the process of drafting these, uh, we hope that they will move forward and we hope that we will be able to use them to advance open science and open access in our uh, local and national environments. Um, but on the other hand, um, we have also seen recently some negative messaging around green OA or uh, repositories by some publishers. Some of you may have seen this blog, OASPA guest blog post that talks about how gold OA is the only real OA um, open access. And we've also seen some comments by um, um, high level uh, um, people at some of the publishers kind of diminishing, uh, devaluing repositories. Um, there's also been kind of some attempts perhaps to capture the repository market by publishers in terms of defining what requirements um, are, what should be the requirements for repositories. And this happened in the context of uh, a conversation at RDA with data repositories. So although there's a lot of good things on, on, on uh, uh, you know, in, in the pipeline, there's also an effort to push back on those good things. And I think we also need to be aware that we have a very highly distributed, diverse, and, and sometimes siloed landscape. And we need to, to overcome that. We don't always sing by the same song, sing the same song or by the same verse. Um, and of course, diversity is one of our, our strengths, but it also can be a challenge in terms of advocating and promoting repositories. So the, the, the purpose of this panel really is to, I think I wanted to raise awareness with you about that we, we feel at core, this is a very key moment for repositories. We'd like to, uh, to get your input and, and help to identify the strengths and some of the barriers so that we can try to leverage those strengths and address some of the issues um, at core and with the broader community. And also we'd like to, to use your, your, um, your comments and your input to develop a kind of community shared narrative for the future of repositories. So um, please again, uh, fill in the menti.com, letting us know where you're based. And I'm gonna switch over quickly to that. And we can just see where people are coming from. Can you see the Mentimeter? Or are you still on the slides? OK, then I think I have to stop sharing. Share screen. OK, I, you can see the Mentimeter now. So the, by far the vast majority of people who are at the panel here are from North America and Western Europe. That's really interesting. So we have a few people from Africa, three people from Asia. Congratulations, because I know it's very late in Asia now. A couple people from Central America, one person from Australia, New Zealand, and nine, nine from, from Eastern Europe. Okay, so thank you very much for letting us know where you're from. And um, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, introduce you to, to our, our panel members. Well, actually, I'll introduce you to our first panel member, who is Eloy Rodriguez. And again, they're, they're going to make very short five to seven minute statements. 
Um, many of you already know Eloy. He is a prominent figure in the repository community. Actually, he was one of the first institutions at University of Minho um, in Portugal to establish an institutional repository. Um, he's also the chair of the executive board of CORE, uh, director of the University of Minho Libraries, and very involved in open air and a member of the European University Association expert group on Science 2.0 and open science. And with that, I'd like to give the floor to, to Eloy. You're muted, Eloy, we can't hear you. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, there, there was probably a problem with my microphone. Sorry, so thank you very much, Kathleen. And uh, 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 thank you also, uh, to, and uh, I would like to, 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 to really welcome the opportunity to, to participate and share this panel with you and Johan and, and Dominic. Uh, and I'll try to, to uh, quickly go through the, the main point or a couple of main points. One is that really uh, uh, re repositories are not uh, a threat or a problem for, the, for, the, for the, the future of open science and open access. On the contrary, I think uh, the future of open science and, and, and open access, uh, a good future really uh, should rely on, on using repositories as a critical component of, of that future. Because uh, uh, the, the, the problems that we're currently facing on the mainstream scholarly communication system, we, I think we all know them and, uh, and, uh, uh, and many people will recognize them. I can just mention uh, some of them. Uh, the first, probably uh, the too much focus on a kind of object that the article or the book, uh, not recognizing all the other or the full range of other contributions that are needed on the knowledge product production uh, process. Uh, uh, the long delays on from submission to publication, while at the same time, this does not mean that there is no problem, no problems on quality control and lack of transparency in peer review uh, on the contrary. Uh, very limited innovation and use of the technologies and the opportunities offered by the digital environment. And we have seen that uh, really, uh, even if the web was invented by, by, by a researcher to, 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 to foster uh, research, uh, to, to foster the, the exchange of information regarding uh, to, to research, really the research community is one of the, the communities that is not uh, using the full power of, of the web. Another problem is the significant biases to the interests of the global north and some on trending research topic. Uh, and the two uh, final ones that I want to, to mention is the increasing concentration and dominance by a very small number of big publishing and not now they are not self uh, uh, designating them as publishing companies, but information and data analytics companies. And finally, very high and, and in my opinion, unjustifiable and unsustainable costs, both for access through subscriptions and also for, to, for publication through article processing charges. As some say in the open access movement, it's true and I agree that there is already enough, I would say even there is more than necessary money on the system. But I really don't believe that just switching the money from subscriptions to APCs can and will solve many of the problems that I've just uh, mentioned. So apart from, from uh, concerns about costs, uh, which may continue to, to rise even on an APC-based world, and we have seen already what is going on with uh, uh, the APCs charged by nature, uh, the problems related with quality, because in, in, a, in an economy that is based on the number of articles that are uh, published, publishers may be incentivized to publish more papers and eventually to, to lower the quality or not be so rigorous on quality. And, and the problem, of course, the, of participation, because researchers without funding, fund, funding will, will have a lot of trouble to, to, to participate to, and to publish. But there is still another important problem that is a more fundamental problem, in my opinion, that this may perpetuate the, and strengthen the, 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 the dominance uh, of those that already dominate the, the market and limit competitiveness uh, and prevent uh, innovation and, and of course the emergence of uh, new models and new players. 
So despite the, the self-interest statements from some publishers, repositories are really not the problem for the future of open access, but on the contrary, they are a fundamental and indispensable component for a better and renewed scholarly communication system that we at core on the last five years, we have been calling it as a global knowledge commons. This is a commons that is more efficient, more inclusive and governed by scholarly community. A commons that there is no barriers to access or to publish uh, research. And we have been promoting this vision, uh, as I said, since uh, six years ago, initially through the Next Generation Repositories Initiative. Uh, I think maybe we, 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 someone can put on the chat the, the, the link for, 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 for those things. Uh, the perfect framework that have been published in 2019, and more recently, the Notify project that I think will be presented uh, 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 after, uh, afterwards in, in this uh, in, in the open repositories conference. Uh, and this vision is really uh, about innovation and looking into, into the future, but at the same time, ironically, is also a kind of back to the past because it's a return to the origins of repositories and the open archives initiative. It's, it is about decoupling the function of scholarly publishing, which had to be completely coupled in the print world, but not, that, uh, but not anymore and distributing them across different actors and communities. Universities and then libraries from, from one side as long lived and sustainable institutions. For instance, in Europe, you know, uh, many university, uh, universities are the, 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 the most long lived institutions after the, the, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and the, those uh, long lived, uh, uh, well uh, uh, preserved institutions can, can uh, uh, act by to can secure the 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 the, the access the the, the preservation uh, to to the research outputs and then research communities as it happens now will continue to undertake certification and quality control using traditional peer review uh, that has many problems as we know or other innovative methods through service layers that can connect the resources hosted on, on, on by by those institutions. But it, it is also about moving uh, to a published and review uh, approach. The, the idea is that articles are first made available through open access repository or a preprint server, and then reviewed by an external review service or an overlay journal. And uh, recently, eLife uh, has announced that it will move exclusively exclusively to this model next month in July 2021. And I will quote their announcement. We welcome this moment and the long awaited opportunity it provides to replace the traditional reviewed and published model developed in the age of the printing press with a published and review model optimized for the age of the internet. And I fully agree with this vision. The overlay and published and review model addresses many of the issues and problems that I previously mentioned at the beginning. It not only innovates and accelerates knowledge sharing, but it also uh, is also more financially sustainable and resilient to concentration of power, buyout or lock-in, because it distributed not only the costs, but also the control across the participating organizations. In January, CORE launched the Notify project, which is developing a common technical model and standard protocols to support communications between preprint servers and repositories with peer review services and overlay journals using linked data notification. Of course, I recognize that there are some important challenges to implement this vision. And I can point out uh, uh, three main challenges that I can immediately identify. One is the, the adoption of these real transformative approaches by the research community. And I think that will only happen uh, uh, if we can uh, strengthen and widen the new practices in research and career assessment that are starting to emerge in, in several uh, parts of, 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 at least in Europe. The second the challenge is to have effective institutional and community support and funding for repositories and the other components of this distributed ecosystem, which will require on the other, on the other end to, to divert funds that are currently directed uh, to, towards large commercial publishers. And finally, it needs convergence, cooperation and coordination at different levels from local to global between the individuals and the institutions that are participating in this knowledge commons. And this is really a challenge. So uh, to conclude, and, and, and uh, as we have heard on the inspiring keynote from Jeremy Farrar at the beginning, the good news is that this vision and this, this approach has really been gaining some traction over the last year with the pandemic, where speed of sharing research outputs has been critical. 
The pandemic has shown that this is possible. So let's use this opportunity to innovate and to create a more equitable, sustainable and inclusive system for scholarly communications. As Jeremy has appealed and challenged us in these closing remarks, let's dare to ask what if and dare to be bold. There is a real opportunity for the research community and research institutions to return to the driver's seat of scholarly communications. And there is a, re a real opportunity for repositories to reinforce their critical role. To close it in a provocative way, it is time to transform repositories from the depots or graveyards of content that is born elsewhere into the birthplace and genesis of research results. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eloy. Um, so we're going to take just a reminder that we will be taking questions or comments at the end of the three panelists presentations or, or statements. So please feel free to put your comment in the chat or should I say probably put it in the Q&A, Lila. Yeah, putting it in the q and A's that lets us just sort them and make sure we get to as many questions as possible. Great, great. So please put your comments or questions. It doesn't have to be a question. Comments too are very welcome and please put them in the chat and we'll go through them at, after the statements. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce our, our next panelist, uh, Johan Rurik, who is the Executive Director of Coalition S and a visiting professor of linguistics at Leiden University. Um, he is also the editor in chief of the Glossa a journal of General Linguistics, which is a diamond journal that does not charge APCs or subscriptions. And some of you may recall in 2015, um, um, Glossa came to, to prominence because the editors and editorial boards of the um, a, a, another journal, a Lingua, which was um, published by Elsevier, actually resigned en masse and launched, um, launched Glossa because um, they were unhappy with the, the pricing models of, of Elsevier. And so we're very pleased to have Johan here with us today. Thank you very much, Johan, and I give you the floor. Thank you, Kathleen, for this uh, introduction. Um, uh, Repositories are, are very important for coalition S, especially, of course, in the context of the rights retention strategy. As you know, we ask authors who wish to publish in subscription journals that they apply a CC BY license to the author accepted manuscript arising from their submission, and then to share that AAM in a repository at publication. This is the minimum requirement for funders. Um, so some funders are still willing to pay for the VOR, but some funders like the European community, for instance, under Horizon Europe go a bit further and they, they, they want uh, all open access publications, whether in gold or in uh, anywhere, AAM and VOR to be deposited in a repository on publication. And that of course creates, uh, I think, great momentum for, um, for, for repositories. Um, because the because of the share volume of, of research money that's being invested in Horizon Europe. So repositories, um, in a nutshell, make sure that all researchers can comply with Plan S. That is very important for us, even if there's no funding for publishing, because it is not just Coalition S uh, authors who can apply the rights retention strategy. I, I have to stress this rights retention strategy, namely to apply a CC BY license to the author accepted manuscript arising from your submission is something that every researcher can do, even if they are not part, uh, even if they are not funded by Coalition S. Um, and in that way, of course, uh, repositories uh, ensure equity because they allow uh, uh, authors to share the AAM uh, with uh, the rest of the world on publication, even if the actual article is behind the paywall. And we did this, of course, in order to ensure that our, that our funded authors could, uh, could publish in, um, in all the journals of their choice. But this is definitely also a strategy that can be used, right? Attention strategy that can be used by, by any author realizing equity. 
Now, to guarantee the success of this repository, Ralph, the implementation guidance of Plan S had stated a number of technical requirements huh, two years ago. Uh, we encouraged the adoption of high standards for repositories, including persistent identifier standard vocabularies and, and quality metadata. And we are we were impressed by the diversity and innovation of core and ex accept, uh, decided to also to accept the norms of the repository co community because, for example, practical advice to the repositories for meeting plan as uh, repository uh, technical requirements was drafted in consultation with core um, i mean uh, unlike the publishers we listen to the community uh, last year the core uh, repository flat platform survey found that most repositories in fact broadly align with plan s requirement that is very reassuring and encouraging another development is that now, the recent development is that Open Door will soon introduce a tool that will allow libraries and institutions to self-assess the extent to which their repository meets Plan S technical requirements for repositories. That will not be uh, public. It will be a kind of a private self-assessment that repositories can do. And that, I think, again, will be useful to strengthen repositories and, and align them technically. Um, but today's panel is about reframing the narrative. Uh, that, that some publishers have tried to create, suggesting that only gold OA publishers can guarantee the quality of the research record. That green OA will mean the end of the publishers as we know it, uh, the end of civilization even, and that institutional repositories are not up to the task of hosting the scholarly record. This publisher narrative, I would say publisher rhetoric, is no doubt a result of the rights retention strategy and suggests that the rights retention strategy has managed to scare them quite a bit. The counter narrative, I think, against this should include the values of trust, uh, inclusion, uh, diversity and innovation that CORE stands for. And I think what should be stressed also in the research community, perhaps much more than, 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 than before, is that repositories are part and perhaps the most important part of the digital infrastructure that is the basis for their work. I mean, this is what they can consult. It is a bit odd, in fact, that it's relatively speaking, uh, easier to obtain funding for expensive equipment and for laboratories than for essential digital infrastructure. And perhaps the global reach uh, of this distributed network and, and the impact of repositories could be given more prominence in, in the narrative going, going forward. Um, in addition, I think uh, repositories should indeed stress that they are an integral part of the academic community. Uh, they should, um, highlight even more this even more i think to the academic community the role that they play in the preservation of the academic uh, uh, record which i think is also reinforced of course by the role that is attributed to them by the repository route uh, the rights retention strategy of of plan s oh. So, so that's about preservation, but in addition to this important role of of preservation i think repositories could also take advantage of what I see is the current fragmentation of publishing services. Basically, um, the, the, it used to be the case that publishing services were sort of this black box of the publishers. You submitted a manuscript on one side of the black box and out came the printed article on the other side. That does not no longer exist, in fact. Uh, you see preprint service playing a, big, uh, a much bigger role. We are seeing journal independent peer review services uh, coming up and also overlay journals. And these are playing an increasingly important role in wresting back control from the com commercial publishers and putting it into the hands of the academic community. Um, so I think uh, repositories like Eloy actually also already suggested, I think repositories should not just preserve uh, the record, but they should take the lead in fostering future research by providing services for hosting preprints, linking to journal independent peer review services and to overlay journals. And I know some of this is already being done in the core uh, Notify project, which intends to provide a standard and interoperable approach that will link reviews and endorsements from these different services with the research input housed in the distributed networks of preprint service archives and repositories. So. I believe that repositories, if taken, if taken seriously by the academic community and by the universities and university administrators, they should be uniquely positioned to take advantage of these developments resulting from the fragmentation of, of publishing services because the repositories uh, are close to research communities. 
Preprint servers are mostly run by academics, not by commercial entities. Many of the new journal independent review services, again, are academic led, non commercial initiatives. And even uh, overlay journals do not need to cost a lot since they just li link back to the peer reviewed and overlay approved version of an article in the repository slash archive. This would, of course, align repositories much more with Diamond Journal initiatives. Uh, which are also close to my heart, as Kathleen mentioned, and hopefully create then a strong academic-led alternative for commercial publishing, which I think is, is, is lacking right now because of the fragmentation, something that we saw also uh, with the Diamond Journals study that we commissioned at, at Plan S and that came out a few months ago. So I would like to conclude by emphasizing the shared values between repositories on the one hand and Diamond Journals on the other, and encourage repositories to much work more closely in, in future with Diamond Journals to introduce sustainability, equity, and innovation into the system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. Thank you very much. Um, and now our final panelist, last but definitely not least, is uh, Dominic Babini. Um, she is a, a very well-known and leading voice for open access in Latin America. Um, she's based in Argentina and is the open science advisor for and previous repository manager at, actually at Claxo, which is a network of 780 social sciences and humanities research institutions in 52 countries, but, but mainly in Latin America. Um, she's a member of UNESCO's Open Science Partnership and the International Science Council Steering Committee on the Future of Scientific Publishing and also a member of the Open Science and Open Repository Advisory Boards of the Ministry of Science in Argentina. And with that, I say welcome, Dominic, and, and I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Thank you for inviting Claxo to participate in this international conference on open repositories. Uh, Claxo Social Sciences and Humanities Repository has been growing in the past 20 years with diversity of contents, not only journal articles. We advocate for bibliodiverse and multilingual scholar-led nonprofit open access. We do it together with other regional initiatives in Latin America, as is the case of La Referencia, the Latin American Network of Repositories, and with the regional journal portals, Latindex, Redalic, Amelica, and Cielo, that help journals in the transition to open access. Today, Latin America is the region of the world with the highest percentage of its journals available in open access. Journals published by universities and other scholarly institutions and funded as part of the cost of research with no charge to read and no charge to publish. In a study about the use of these open access contents, 75% of use comes from university students and professors for learning and teaching and from researchers, and to a lesser extent by practitioners and citizens looking for information in the web. This conference takes place in this particular pandemic times as the opening session conference by Jeremy mentioned. These times are challenging our science and science communication systems worldwide, so as to speed up co-production, sharing and analysis of new knowledge about this new virus and its variants requiring collaboration between scientists and other societal actors beyond the scientific community. We see health practitioners, government epidemiologists, and even patients reporting symptoms and other data in their cellular phone applications and in computer networks. And part of this knowledge at some point is also shared in preprints, in journals, and in repositories. And we also see great activity gathering data from community and government sources, trade unions, business organizations, and NGOs to better understand the devastating socioeconomic consequences of the extended lockdowns and inform policy with data 
at national and local levels to support their daily decisions about direct economic help to families and to businesses during these lockdowns. This intense production and sharing of data among diverse societal actors facing the pandemic is also a methodology needed when facing other emergency as is the climate change and food, securing food. It is difficult to imagine any of the 17 sustainable development goals that does not require as much local knowledge published in local languages in diversity of formats, as well as contents in the av available in the so-called mainstream journals. This is why the decentralized global network of repositories is so important in this transition to open science that promotes bibliodiversity and multilingualism in subcholarly communications and co-production of knowledge of researchers with other societal actors. In our region, Latin America, where research and research communications are publicly funded, with universities having a leading role in research publishing and ownership of open access infrastructures and services, repositories are the preferred venue in open access policies and legislations being approved. We need more national and international funding to strengthen these community government governed, community-led open access publishing infrastructures before commercial interests move further in our developing regions. The consolidation of power and market by few corporations in the world is not an efficiency and market issue. It is an equity issue with strong implications for social justice. From our experience, we express the need for more international and national funding to address priorities in repositories, of which we mention now only three that support what is called by core the next generation repositories, with value added services, as is the case of. The first we mention is, and it is mentioned also the need in the chat, organizing peer review for contents for repositories so that the, those contents can be identified in research and research assessment. In second place, add to repositories functionalities and metadata to manage also preprints fair research data, increase information about researchers, projects, and funders. A third place and last, an accelerate review of research assessment procedures and career evaluation systems in order to align them with the principles of open science, where repositories can play a more important role. If in the research assessment systems, we put all publication venues that certify quality on the same footing, it will remove some of the pressure to publish in the prestige journals. It will make Dora and Leiden recommendations easier to implement. We strongly believe in the leading role of public funding and community-led repositories and platforms to strengthen open access and open science scholarly communications. We do not believe in APCs and commercial outsourcing for a better future of scholarly communications in our developing region. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dominic. Uh, it's very important to have um, voices from developing countries um, uh, in terms of helping us design a system that works for everyone. So thank you for your contribution over the years and, and for participating in this panel. Um, uh, so we, we have a time issue here. We've only got 20 minutes left. We're falling a bit behind. So what I thought I would propose is that I would ask each one of the panelists, there's a number of questions in the, in the, in the Q&A, and so I'm going to choose 
um, which panelist um, can answer one of these questions, each of these questions. So I won't open the floor to everyone. And then we can move on to our, our poll, our Mentimeter poll. Okay, so the first question here is, um, or, or comment question is from, from Rutger de Jong, I guess. Um, uh, publishers do play a large role in getting the right reviewers. How can we make sure that a pre-publish first also means all articles will be actually reviewed by experts? And I'm gonna ask Eloy to, to answer this one. Okay, thanks, Kathleen. Uh, so I, I think on the, on the published and review model, uh, the, the quality control uh, can be also made by, by journals as we know them, as also as by independent uh, 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 review uh, uh, services as we are, for instance, now I think also Johan uh, mentioned that, uh, um, uh, for instance, uh, the Royal Society, some journals of the Royal Society have have commissioned the, 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 the review service to PCI, that is a, a community-led initiative for, for, for peer review. And the other point, so I think this can, can happen or can also work uh, on this environment as it works on, on, on the traditional environment. The point is, and I, I'm, I don't want to be extremely provocative, is not all the, 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 the things will be reviewed. The, the point is that it, what is needed is that it is clear what is reviewed by whom, what is the, what, so what we really need is a much more transparent because one of the problems of, with current peer review systems is also the lack of, 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 of transparency. So uh, I think this can, uh, uh, this uh, published uh, then, then review model can, uh, can uh, secure uh, the quality control at least at the same level or even at a better level because it can improve transparency and, and the involvement of the community on, on, the, on the review uh, process. Okay, thank you, Eloy. Um, the next uh, question will go to Johan. Um, the rights retention strategy is not part of EU law, I think, but a consequence of a contract between funder and fundee. However, this does mean that you cannot use the rights retention strategy if you do not have a contract either with the publisher or a party such as the EU that can pay legal costs if the publisher goes after you. Question mark. Sorry, it's a little bit more complicated than that, actually, um, or a little bit <laughs> less, less, less stark than, than this. Um, first of all, not part of EU law. That, de that depends on what you, what you call EU law. If you call EU law um, the, that the model grant agreement has been, has been uh, approved by Parliament, then it is part of EU law. Uh, so th there is some discussion about this. But you could see it as as being part of 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 the EU agreement, so to speak. It's not EU law in the sense that you can completely count on it as a, as 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 a firm law, but it is definitely been approved by by model grant agreement has been approved as such, and the model grant agreement of the EC contains language about the rights retention strategy. So so that's that's very clear. Uh, you can use the rights retention strategy even if you are not a funder. It is true that you are at that point uh, not uh, protected by a funder in the same way as you would otherwise. However, uh, let's not forget that I, I, I personally think that the, the, the publishers will not come after authors. It would be very bad for their public image. Um, uh, uh, of course, I mean, and if you are in that position uh, that, that the publisher comes after you, even if you are not funded by Coalition S, uh, please get in contact with us or by get in contact with your li librarian because we would like to hear about it. Um, CC BY, when you assign CC BY to a version of an article, that right is inherent in that article and cannot be taken away. The only thing a publisher can do is to refuse your article on submission. That they have a right to do. They have a right to decline your article, to, to handle your article. The moment they start handling your article and there is a decision on that, and, and your article ca carries in, for instance, the first sub footnote in 10, 10, 10, um, 10 point uh, fonts, the, the notion a CC by 
license is applied to the AM arising from this situation, you have given proper notice to the publisher and they cannot override that. I mean, the rights retention strategy has now been out for a year. Uh, nobody has, to, uh, no, no publisher has challenged it in court. Sorry to be a bit long about this, but this is close to my heart. <laughs> Thanks, Johan, we, we can tell. Um, so there, this one I'm gonna ask Dominique to answer because she already started uh, at, uh, kind of responding to this in her, in her statement. What advice do you have for those of us who are struggling to advocate for the value of green OA at the institutional level um, at, or and other non-gold OA um, due to a pervasive obsession with journal prestige economy? Are there any specific strategies you can recommend for either confronting or debunking this obsession or working around it? Yes. May I start with a personal uh, experience. In a Claxo conference, the former president of uh, Uruguay, Mojica, uh, was speaking to an audience of 30,000 young people in Medellin, in Colombia. And um, he said, don't do my mistake. Don't take the guns to change politics, just get into politics and become president of your country as I did. Well, when we started advocating for open access 20 years ago, we did a mistake that advocates today should not do. We advocated for open access, but we didn't in parallel. We started fighting big publishers and uh, paywalls and uh, but we did not advocate for a change in the evaluation systems we started two years ago in claxo we started a latin american forum on research assessment and uh, we are uh, working together with national research councils and uh, in dialogue with NRESH in Europe and uh, other movements in the world as DORA, as Leiden Manifesto. So we have to work on changing the evaluation systems because in Latin America, the impact factor is the main indicator to evaluate researchers and institutions and then rankings so that is my recommendation to advocate for changes in the evaluation system so that we reward quality and not prestige and that we reward um, multilingualism peer review why do we all why do uh, peer review goes only to prestige journals we have to reward doing peer review of repositories also, and of diamond journals. So the reward system is include, please, in your agenda for advocacy to speak about the issues of how do we assess research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, so uh, I think there are a couple more questions, but I, I think we're going to go now to the Mentimeter poll. Um, uh, just given that we only have 12 more minutes for the panel. So I'm going to share my screen again. And what I need to do is somehow So if I'm sharing my screen, how can I advance the Mentimeter? Sorry, let me try to figure out how to do this now. There is a slide at the bottom. Slide. Okay. So here we go. Let me just present. Now, here's where we're hoping to get your, your input so that CORE can help to advance and develop strategies to expand and enhance and, and advocate for repos the repository networks. So I'd like to again invite you to 
please go to menti.com using this code and tell us what you think are the strongest attributes related to the global repository network. And I think the idea here is that we can use these attributes in our messaging around the importance of repositories. Okay. So it looks like um, community oriented is something that resonates strongly with the global network of repositories, as well as sustainable and distributed control, um, less so in terms of quality assurance or, or innovation. Irina, did you say you could see where I could advance this? Oh, there it is. Okay, I see it. So um, did we miss anything? What is the strongest attribute re related to the global network of repositories? What did we miss? Interoperability. integrity, connected, multilingualism. Fair. This is, this is all really great information. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Thank you very much. What is the most important barrier related to consolidating the role of the global network of repositories? I'm not surprised to see under resourcing and underfunding <laughs> come up as number one. So interoperability was something that was noted as a an important attribute but also sometimes there's a lack of interoperability as well. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Um, did we miss anything? What is the most important barrier related to consolidating the role of the global network of repositories? What did we miss? Yeah.
I see publishers has a prominent role here. And I think we, we, we are definitely aware of that given some of the activities we've seen in the past year or so. But I guess the other one I wanted to note here is the academic resistance from the academic community as well. Thank you very much. So this is the last slide. What activity will contribute most to is increasing the value of the global network of repositories? What do we collectively need to do? One of the things um, I wanted to also mention about this is that given that most of the people uh, who indicated where they were located, um, that these the information we're getting here is really probably most relevant for North America and, and Western Europe. And there may be different messages or different responses for people in, in other regions. So I just wanted to mention that we're, we're also aware of that. And that work we need to do may differ regionally and nationally. So the first thing here is funder and institutional requirements, which of course we know are very important for advancing um, uh, participation and depositing repositories, but also greater functionality of platforms, better messaging, shared infrastructure and higher priority. Okay, and this is the last slide. Did we miss anything in terms of what we can do to increase the value of the global repository network? And I'm just gonna give people one minute and then, and then we will close the panel destroy publishers. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks. Standards financing cooperation and teamwork are very high here. Okay, that's, that's great. Well, um, on that note, I'd, I'd like to thank you very much for your input. Uh, as I mentioned, CORE is really interested in advancing and in defining some strategies for advancing the global network at the international level, working with national and regional partners. And the information we got from you today will be very helpful in doing that. And I'd also like to thank very much again, our three panelists, Eloy, Johan, and Dominic for their excellent contributions. Um, I wish you a great rest of the conference and, um, and a great rest of your day or evening. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Kathleen, for inviting thank us. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Kathleen. Bye, everyone. And thank you to all our panelists. That was a, a really wonderful, um, engaging discussion. Uh, I took a lot of notes. Um, next, in this room, um, we're go moving on to presentations. Um, and uh, so this is room one, in case you're looking for, there's also a, a second room if you go back into 
SCED, there's a link for that. Um, so this is presentation session one, repositories and COVID-19, fostering diversity and inclusion. And we'll just take a two minute break, you know, shake your, shake your arms out, refresh your, your cup of coffee or tea, um, and um, we'll get started in just a minute. the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and she will be presenting um, the Carolina Digital Repository during COVID-19, responding to a pandemic. Rebecca, take it away. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Looks great. Great, thank you. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Cuddy and I'm the Institutional Repository Librarian at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So I manage um, UNC's Institutional Repository, which is the Carolina Digital Repository or CDR. And I wanted to highlight three projects which I managed over the last year to increase the amount of scholarly content available in CDR. So just a little bit about CDR before we get started. Um, as I said, CDR is an institutional repository. So it supports all types of scholarship, data, student papers, open access articles, the usual IR materials. It's built on Samvera Hyrax. And we launched the Hyrax version of CDR in June of 2019. It was previously hosted on the custom Fedora platform, and that's now our digital collections repository. So after we launched the new repository, there was a concerted effort to increase the amount of scholarly content in CDR. So UNC has an open access policy, and we wanted to support that. And CDR had long hosted student papers, and we still do that, but there was known on campus as the student paper repository, and so we wanted to broaden that perception. So as Jeremy um, highlighted in the keynote, there were challenges and benefits surrounding the pandemic and repositories, um, and a few points resonated with me as I was considering CDR's response to the pandemic. So last year, as many institutions were closing campuses, there was a lot of talk about increasing access to scholarly content and making sure the content was open and accessible to users. And as Jeremy mentioned, many scholarly publishers made their content openly available for the duration of the pandemic, but didn't exactly define what the duration of the pandemic was. And so the content could go away at any moment. The repositories can help by making content openly available legally and in perpetuity. So to help um, increase the amount of openly available scholarly content, I managed three projects, which I'll talk about in the next few slides. So the first project was a project to upload a large amount of vendor supplied content to CDR. So in 2018, UNC libraries purchased a report from OneScience, which listed metadata permissions and PDF download links for 47,000 articles written by UNC Chapel Hill researchers. So our initial reaction was, this is great. It could be a really quick way to achieve our goal of changing the direction of CDR from student papers to faculty scholarship really quickly. But as these things go, um, once we got into the project, we realized it would not be quite as quick and easy as we hoped. So our first challenge was scale. We realized that loading 47,000 articles into the repository all at once was not gonna work out. Um, so we decided to separate out the articles into batches based on their permissions. So I worked with Anne Gilliland, our scholarly communications officer to identify general rules that we could use to create the batches. And I'll talk a little bit more about the individual batches on the next slide. Secondly, we had some metadata issues. Um, our metadata librarian, Anna Goslin, and metadata specialist, Julia Gutzeit, looked at the metadata and we found that the report did not list affiliation data for all authors. So we use affiliation data to populate our department list, which you can see on the right of the slide, and also a department facet so that users can restrict their searches to results from a particular department. So our metadata team recommended using Scopus's API to populate the author affiliation data and to validate author order. And we also use an int internal controlled vocabulary for our departmental affiliations. So the metadata team needed to map the Scopus provided affiliations to the internal vocabulary. And then we also had to download all those PDFs for each batch 
Luckily, the spreadsheet included an automated download script, which added file names, but it took a few tries to get it working properly. And then a repository developer had to merge the metadata from the spreadsheet, with the file names, Scopus metadata, and all the mapped affiliation data into one source for ingest. So we did several test ingests to validate data and that the PDFs and metadata were matching up correctly. So the first batch was loaded in April of 2020, consisted of about 5,000 articles. Those, these were articles that were covered under UNC's open access policy. The second batch was loaded in the end of October, November 2020, and consisted of about 22,000 articles. And this batch was accepted manuscripts, which were openly available in PubMed Central. The third batch is in progress and is about 5,000 articles. These articles have open licenses or allow the publisher version to be deposited, according to Sherpa Romeo. So we have about 13,000 left, and we'll need to go through these individually to make sure we can deposit the version linked in the spreadsheet. We had a lot of help um, from our graduate assistant, Carmen White, who looked through the PDFs linked in the spreadsheet and assessed whether she thought they were publisher versions, preprints, or postprints. So we'll use that information to create the final batch. So some lessons learned, um, even things we thought would work out of the box still need some work, particularly when we have unique requirements for our repository, like the department facet. Doing lots of test batches really, really helped. Um, the test batches enabled us to find metadata errors and differences. And third, we learned we needed to anticipate more time than we initially thought. Um, right around the time we loaded batch two, our lead repository developer left for a new position. And so we have to regroup. Um, we, the remaining developers needed additional time to get familiar with the increasingly complex upload process. So the next project was a CV review project. So in March of 2020, several um, of the digital collections folks um, at the library were approached about doing, putting together some remote work projects for library staff. So this group created six projects, um, which use Microsoft Teams um, that on-site library workers could do remotely. So I'm going to talk about one of the projects, which is CV Review. Um, this was the project that immediately came to mind when I was approached about this um, initiative. Um, because it was a project I've long wanted to do because I thought it could be really useful to get um, some underserved subject areas into the repository, but it was something that was way too time consuming to do myself. So with some increased um, staff time, this seemed like a great opportunity to explore more fully. The so CV review entails um, looking at faculty CVs to identify articles eligible for deposit. Process is pretty simple. Um, the library workers chose a department from a shared sign-up sheet. They could choose whichever department matched their interests. Um, they then used Google to find the department's website and the faculty CVs if they wanted to use Google Scholar or Weather Science or Scopus to look up um, articles, they could also do that. The workers then entered metadata for each faculty member's scholarly articles into a spreadsheet. And then they looked up deposit policies for each article in Sherpa Romeo. And for this initiative, we concentrated on articles which were eligible for deposit via UNC's open access policy, or that Sherpa Romeo said the publisher version was allowed to be deposited. Then they downloaded the PDFs of all the eligible articles and uploaded the full package to the team site for review. So I did have to create some training materials for them, which included um, written directions on the team's wiki, templates, including a metadata template and a sample file package. And also I created a video tutorial of the process. So the project was a pretty, pretty good success. Um, as of April, 2021, the team reviewed 551 CVs, about 21,000 articles. Out of these articles, only about 7,000 were eligible for deposit. We had 24 people who worked on and off throughout the project. So it was a mix of permanent staff, graduate assistants, and work-study students. Overwhelmingly, the workers chose to focus on humanities and social sciences content, which is great. It's what I hoped they would focus on, and it, it worked out. And I'm really, really grateful for all the work that the team put into the project. 
the lessons learned, um, the flexible nature of the project really contributed to its success. Workers could look at the training materials at their own pace whenever they happen to be working. This was especially important during the early part of the pandemic when workers were transitioning to work from home. The CV review project, though it's very, very time consuming, was a great way to target underserved areas of repository content. The UNC Chapel Hill has a strong social sciences emphasis, but it's not reflected in the repository content because that trends more towards the social sci the sciences rather in medicine. So thanks to the CV review project, we have a backlog of social sciences content for the repository. And now I need to um, develop a plan for reviewing and contacting researchers and then loading content to the repository. And I, ideally I'd like to keep the project going in some capacity with a grad assistant, but we'll see how that goes. And then the final project that I'll talk about is a subset of the CV review project, which specifically addresses coronavirus research. So this project was inspired by a few different but related things. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the pandemic increased publishers and researchers, so the public and researchers' appetites for more information about coronaviruses. Um, also, to some local interest, um, in February 2020, a colleague of mine saw a Bloomberg News article which profiled Dr. Ralph Barrick, who is a researcher at UNC who's an expert on coronaviruses. And around that same time in April 2020, Microsoft Academic ranked UNC Chapel Hill as the highest ranked US university for coronavirus research. The UNC is clearly well regarded in doing important work on coronaviruses. And this created an opportunity for us. We could identify individual researchers who were doing that work and deposit their articles in CDR so that everyone can access them. So initially, I looked at a list of researchers who were working in Dr. Barrick's lab, and also um, the School of Medicine released a list of researchers who were doing work related to coronaviruses. So I incorporated that list as well. Use the same process as the CV review project to review faculty CVs and identify eligible articles. The School of Medicine had a pretty broad view of coronavirus research in their um, list of researchers. They included people who were working in related but still fairly relevant fields. So we took a very broad view as well. So this project um, reviewed 85 CVs, about 11,000 articles. And out of these articles, only about 4,000 were eligible for deposit. Um, most of the articles were in science and medicine, which given the subject matter and that the list of researchers came from the School of Medicine, that wasn't all that surprising. I also created a collection of the works which dealt with coronaviruses and the pandemic specifically, rather than taking that broad view of coronaviruses and related work. The collection also includes presentations and student papers. As you might imagine, COVID and its impacts have been quite the popular student paper topic this year. So the lessons learned, um, faculty are happy to have the research deposited. Um, out of 85 faculty contacted, we only had two who declined to have their research deposited. Many were enthusiastic and voiced their support of open access. Current events can also be used to drive repository interest and content. Our library communications team wrote a story about the project on the library website, and it then got picked up by the university's news site. The Anne or scholarly communications officer and I were interviewed and that helped spread the word about the collection and the library's open access efforts. And with my short time, I'd like to briefly mention two initiatives that we did for the repository that um, affected the success of these projects. So we had to do some optimization work for Google Scholar. Um, Google Scholar is the largest referrer of traffic to CDR, so we needed to make sure the content we added was discoverable for their standards. Um, so we added additional meta tags, as you can see on this um, slide here, and we also implemented um, author ordering, which was not something that was present out of the box in Hyrax. And since we had already deposited content into CDR, we needed to do some remediation work to make sure that authors for the content that was already in the repository were ordered correctly. Finally, we implemented batch upload with the bulk racks gem. 
Um, that chef load also does not come with Hyrax, but it was really key to loading the COVID authors and CV review papers into CDR quickly and efficiently. We could not have loaded the works as quickly as we did without some sort of bulk tool. So BulkRax uses a CSV import to map metadata to files. So this is my um, email address and my Twitter handle. I think we have may have time for questions, but if you think of something later, please feel free to email or tweet at me. Thanks so much for that presentation, Rebecca. That was really interesting. Uh, it looks like you were hard at work. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, there's um, the first question you mostly answered already, um, but I'm just, so the question is uh, about how you contacted um, authors for permission. So can you just talk about, I know you mentioned that you did, but can you talk mm -hmm. a tiny bit about that process? Sure, so the process, um, we went back and forth with this with the scholarly communications officer, but we um, used an opt-out approach for um, a lot of these CVs. So we would call, we would, email them a list of eligible articles and then give them a deadline by which they should respond if they did not want their articles to be deposited. And if we didn't hear from them or if they emailed us back and said that they were fine with depositing, we went ahead with deposit. Wow. And did you have many uh, faculty members say no? No, um, we've only had, I think I mentioned two. One person yeah. was a little bit ticked about the opt-out approach, but by and large, no, they've been fairly supportive. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. That's a really uh, heartening uh, response. Um, and then the next question is, um, have you seen or are you tracking uh, uh, Google Scholar hits as a result of the meta tag enhancement? You we a are, and we yeah. have seen a substantial increase in Google Scholar traffic after we implemented the um, optimization in the meta tags. So if you're not doing it in your repository, I think it's it's worth investing some time in it. No, just a success all around. Um, yeah. thank, you so, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing uh, this, this uh, your, your very successful year. Um, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, and with that, we'll move to our next presentation, um, which is the Connecticut Digital Archive in Context. And so um, we have uh, Greg Claudi and Michael, I'm gonna butcher your last name. Uh, uh, so- Denise, this uh, is fine, yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Greg and Michael, um, take it away. We're, we're so uh, lucky to have you here. Sure, thanks so much. Uh, good day, everyone, and welcome to CTD in Context, a program of the Connecticut Digital Archive at the University of Connecticut in the United States. Um, we are not reporting today on a project we've completed, but talking about a structural change to our repository program that we're hoping to create. And we're inviting anyone interested in joining the conversations we are having about how repositories represent and create the cultures they seek to preserve. <clears throat> I want to introduce a team that originally developed the idea that grew into CTDA in context. First, I'm Greg Kalani, I'm the director of the CTDA um, here at the University of Connecticut, and we serve the entire state of Connecticut. With me is Mike Camisis, CTDA's repository manager. He's been with the CTDA for almost four years now and has been really responsible uh, for most of the driving forces behind CTDA in context. Uh, Kayla Higson Grant is a student intern from Mount Holyoke College. She is not be able to uh, appear with us today, but I think that you'll see her contributions be evident as we proceed uh, with our presentation. So a little bit about the CTDA. Uh, we're a collaborative membership organization headquartered at the University of Connecticut Library, and we provide memory institutions around the state with preservation and access services. We also serve as a service hub and aggregator for the Digital Public Library of America. And we've been doing that for the past two and a half years. Founded in 2011, the CTDA has grown to include over 70 cultural organizations uh, around the state. And we have recently started supporting preservation services for state agencies and academic research libraries for non-cultural organizational records in mid 2020. 
CTDA in context came about from a realization that we had that the CTDA's collections did not reflect the diversity of the citizens and the communities in Connecticut. And that our member institutions also did not accurately represent the breadth of memory and collecting organizations from around the state. This is really the result of a traditional approach we had toward membership, collecting, describing, presenting, and even defining cultural heritage that runs through the CTDA and its membership. This traditional approach was unintentional, but it illustrates many of the structural barriers to diversity and inclusion that exist today in digital preservation. As we built the program, we wanted to establish our credibility by including the major players in the Connecticut cultural community, which was itself dominated by traditional organizations. So the program we built was generally that the program we built generally re reflected that power structure. As the CTDA grew to dozens of institutions and millions of objects, it became obvious that CTDA resources had concentrations in some areas and not in others. It also became obvious that collection and object descriptions ref reflected a monolithic cultural outlook and that the contributors to CTDA also reflected the traditional power structures of cultural heritage documentation. As we debated what to do, we were confronted with some structural and social constraints related to the CTD itself that may change more difficult, some of which we just alluded to and others will address in the next few slides. So the work of the CTD was not significantly affected by the pandemic, but the general slowdown in activities across the membership gave us time and space to examine the intellectual foundations of our program and begin to think about the CTDA as an influencer and recorder of Connecticut's cultural history more broadly. In the spring of 2020, Connecticut native Kayla Hickson Grant, at the time a rising senior at Mount Holyoke College who was majoring in anthropology, contacted us about an internship opportunity. Kayla was interested in exploring the effect of power in documenting history. Through her research and subsequent articles and our web publication, CTDA Connect, and there's a link here in the slide to her main article, Kayla illustrated for the public and our membership the inherent biases in our collections and offered ideas about how to address them. From these conversations and writings came the idea of CTDA in context. At first, we thought we could address the questions and issues uncovered by Kayla's research through public programs and workshops, but we quickly understood that the questions had more to do with structural and systematic issues in our program and how it defined and connected to the cultural community in Connecticut that no workshop or public program could completely or adequately address. As the only statewide cultural heritage preservation program in Connecticut, we believe that the CTDA has a responsibility to lead discussions about how collecting and descriptive practices shape understanding of culture and defines what is worth saving and what's excluded from the historical record. After months of discussion and discussion which is still going on, CTDA in context is developing into an ongoing activity and not a one-off program or project. CTDA in context has become a chance for us to reflect on our program, understand where it is now and where it needs to go. At this point, as I said earlier, we've barely begun, but we believe that we've started that journey with a good first step understanding that these issues are structural and conceptual rather than merely operational. Our first step in our journey is to find out who we are, providing a baseline picture for the cultural preservation world of the CTDA in 2021. We need to understand what is in the digital repository in a systematic fashion. With more than 3,600 collections containing over 2.5 million digital objects from more than 70 institutions, you might expect that resources of the CTDA are broad, and they are, but they are broad within the constraints of the kind of institutions and collecting policies that exist within them. We do not dictate what people add to the repository, and Greg will talk about that a little later. In order to bring evidence to what we know anecdotally to be true, we are embarking on a set of projects to understand ourselves. We have two summer interns, uh, Rachel Nutt and Heather Owens, both graduate students at the University of Syracuse High School. Rachel and Heather will begin working on three main topics. They will gather and review mission, vision, and collecting policies from each CTDA member organization in order to see how they approach collecting. They will analyze the collections in the CTDA, compare them with the stated missions of the membership to see how the reality lines up with the ideal. 
And they will also collect and analyze membership statements from DP, other DPLA service hubs and compare them with the CTDA's membership policies to answer the question, is CTDA membership more or less open than others around the country? So step two is finding out then, after we find out who we are, we have to find out who we are not. And what is missing from this historical record and why? Kayla's initial research on the nature of the historical record in the CTDA formed an anecdotal baseline for what was in the collection and also about the collection groups that were not represented. We're starting a wider institution with some of our uh, local members and some members of some of the DPLA hubs about what is a memory institution to better understand who can or should or might contribute and how we can ensure not only the permanence of the data they contribute, but the permanence of the stewardship of that data. Another activity is to investigate the landscape of collecting groups, as we're starting to call them in Connecticut, that are not part of the CTDA to identify potential new participants. But identifying potential new participants is much easier than getting those participants to actually participate. So how does an organization made up of almost exclusively of the power elite expand its membership and the scope of its collections? How do we encourage new voices to participate in our discussions and our programs? How do we create a trust relationship between the CTDA and our targeted potential members? How do we make the CTDA a trusted voice for inclusive digital preservation? Luckily, we don't need to invent all of this ourselves or have all of the answers. We're going to follow the example of some successful programs, such as the Louisiana Digital Library, the Minnesota Digital Library, and also look to the DPLA as an organization, as leaders in this field, and adapt their successes and their initiatives to our local program. But even with models to follow, the path we foresee is not easy. Uh, getting back to some of the structural issues that um, that we see is that one of the mantras of the CTDA in context is how can we overcome the challenges we all face? And the CTDA faces some very specific challenges based on its origin, funding, and home. We are a voluntary membership organization. We can't compel people to, to join us or work with us. The good news though, is that there is no cost to participate. So it's really easy to join. Uh, we can facilitate and encourage conversation among the membership, but again, we can't force them to do things in any particular way. Um, we also have the idea that there should be a very low bar to entry, and we have very few requirements. And some people ask us, well, does low bar mean low standards? And we ask the question then is, well, what are standards anyway? And how do we adapt them for a more diverse community. The CTDA, however, represents many things that underdocumented groups and community organizers fear and dislike. It is highly structured, although less so than many repository programs, and its structures are not always in line with the values of some of underdocumented groups. Yukon itself is symbolic of oppression to some, including many of the groups we hope to reach. In fact, its very existence as a land-grant university is based on exploiting indigenous peoples. But Yukon has resources that it can devote to this cause. And as a statewide organization, the CTDA can be a place to facilitate change. These are just some of the questions that we've been talking about and asking and conversations that we will be having as we seek to inspire institutional and systematic change, not only within our program, but with our participating institutions. We would invite anyone interested to join in the conversation because we are at the very beginning of our discussions for change. Please visit our website, ctdaincontext.org to learn more about the project and a link to the actual CTDA and feel free to email uh, ctda at uconn.edu. Greg and I are the two people that run the CTDA and it ends up in our inbox. Um, so we will we will see it. So thank you. And we're happy to uh, entertain any questions you may have either now or uh, by other means. Thanks for keeping the time. I don't see any um, <laughs> questions <laughs> uh, from the audience right now. I guess my question would be, 
like if you could wave your magic uh, server and have something like two years from now, what would what would the biggest change to the CTDA be? Uh, I think uh, I'll go first. I think we would have more diverse types of organizations. So there are a lot of organizations, social clubs uh, that are that are more informal in their approach that are not 501c3 for those of you that are in the US or do not have a charter about um, maintaining the history of a particular group, but they have the history of that group. And those people have traditionally not been part of the CTDA or any of these repositories. And so how do we get these kinds of records into the historical record. I think that's one thing, and it might probably has another thing about how we talk about these um, right collections. Uh, right, kind of you know looking at description, but also kind of um, just allowing for space for these discussions to happen. We have the resources to do that, and we're not trying to give anybody anything. We just want to be here as a resource. Um, and we're not trying to help anybody. We want to give people, we want to give these underdocumented groups the agency to do what they need to do best for their collections. So even if that does not mean going with us, right? But having, knowing that we exist and we gave them a, a space or we're, we're providing a space. We're not giving anyone anything. We're not out there to help people. We want to, we want people to come to us or we want to go to them and say, what do you need for your collection? And how can we be a resource for you? We don't want to go in there and dictate kind of like we do to small historical societies and public libraries, because we, we know how to do that. That's not going to work. And I think it's taken a while for us to realize we need to be really flexible in that. So more flexible approach to how we how we work with, with all types of people. Those are, those are really great goals. And um, it sounds like you're doing the work to get there. So um, thank you for, for this whole presentation. Um, Courtney Muma asks, have you looked at documentation strategy at all? Oh, uh, you know, do, oh, go ahead. Um, documentation strategy is a great idea. And again, that has not traditionally been the place of the CTDA to tell people what to collect. But we're thinking that, like, we're the only people that can have that conversation. Uh, that's a great idea, though. The co documentation strategy, uh, we might try to do that on a collective scale. Yeah, that's, thank you, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess the second part of your question is about uh, funding for those, for these organizations you're trying to offer opportunities to. I, I can jump in there, Greg, real quick. That was something that was on our list of like, we need to do this yesterday. Um, let's do it. And then we talk it, we took it to the working group and they're like, well, what, where's the foundation for this? How are you gonna do that? We kind of jumped ahead to say we need to help these folks right now without kind of thinking like, well, how are we going to approach helping or how are we gonna approach this kind of funding? We can't just go in there and say, hey, the University of Connecticut is gonna give you money, do this work. Um, so I think we, that's one goal we thought about and we had in the beginning all different words we used uh, for support, outreach, that kind of stuff. I think that's something that we're gonna look at it's something we haven't done. It's something we've tossed about for doing for the people that we work with now, kind of doing regranting stuff. Um, so that's something that's definitely on, on our board. Yeah, thank you. That's, um, those are big funding. Opens a whole new infrastructure challenge. Right. So uh, I wish yeah. you luck in that in the future. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for this um, wonderful presentation. If um, attendees have more questions uh you know uh find greg and michael in on email in the chat wherever <laughs> wherever they are so wherever uh, we are. Wherever thanks you are. so much thank you thank you so much um uh, next up we have um eleanor Presanti with uh, her presentation connected in science how archive facilitates global interactions during the pandemic and beyond We're almost seeing your slides. 
hopefully it goes through. There we go. You're all set, Eleanor. You're muted, sorry. There you go. Okay, thank you. Now I should be uh, I should be ready to go. Sounds good. So uh, thanks everyone for uh, for joining and thanks for uh, inviting me to uh, present here. Uh, I, I'm uh, going to give a little bit of an introduction about uh, uh, the role of archive and how we see it. Uh, even though I know that uh, the majority of people here are very familiar and already know it, but I think it will help uh, to kind of uh, uh, highlight uh, the, um, the effect and what I learned uh, through the pandemic uh, about uh, the role of preprints and what it means for, for our future as well. Um, so let's see, okay. So Archive uh, uh, is a, a service that uh, uh, is uh, working uh, worldwide. We have uh, submissions uh, from uh, uh, many, many countries around the world. Uh, we, uh, we exist thanks to um, a network of volunteers. We have uh, about 185 moderators uh, uh, that work uh, in uh, seven different uh, subject areas. Uh, each subject area has also an advisory committee. And then we have uh, two boards, one for the scientific aspect of archive and one for uh, the more, uh, let's say, organizational uh, library oriented version um, of the board. And uh, we exist also thanks to members. Members are libraries and institutions around the world uh, that uh, contribute to, to archive. And uh, uh, so, and, and that's, I think it's for me a, a very important aspect of why uh, of how archive works because uh, it uh, really puts the uh, the weight and the power uh, in the hands of those who are using archive uh, and therefore uh, there is this connection between archive governance and archive uh, um, uh, budget and also about what our priorities and uh, vision is. So uh, for this reason, uh, the uh, main uh, mission of archive uh, is uh, to uh, really facilitate the life of researchers in their uh, research workflow. So it goes from uh, read uh, new work and stay current uh, um, quickly of what happens really at the last few days, week of, uh, of in their field, uh, share their research uh, instantaneously and uh, uh, fulfill their uh, open access requirement. We are still uh, working uh, around this uh, to, su to support uh, and to be completely fully compatible with uh, uh, European requirements, particularly because of uh, the metadata that we capture, but that is our plan for this year to ensure that uh, uh, we can do that. So I also wanted to give a little bit of a history of, uh, of preprints. Uh, preprints existed uh, um, since uh, many years uh, even before archive uh, was even uh, thought about uh, uh, but they were a, a paper uh, article that uh, people had to share with their colleagues and friends uh, 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 by hand uh, to get feedback from them and for other people to to know about what was going on in the uh, in their department uh, or in their field in uh, 1989 uh, john con uh, realized that uh, uh, tech tech files uh, are really good because they can be compiled and produced a very good high quality PDF or, or postscript uh, while maintaining a very small size for what concerns the source file. So that allowed uh, even in those years to share articles digitally uh, with a large number of people. And she organized this, uh, this uh, through email lists. So people could just sign up for, uh, for an email and, and uh, every day she would send uh, uh, manually curated emails uh, with all the, um, the preprints. Uh, at the time it was really only in uh, high energy physics. Um, in, uh, in the 90, basically, uh, the World Wide Web was uh, uh, was invented, was uh, created, and so with uh, this, uh, with the knowledge of this new technology, Paul Ginsberg uh, thought about uh, 
automatizing the distribution list uh, uh, that was created uh, and really uh, create uh, an archive that was internet based uh, and uh, that was uh, archive for the first time. And uh, I actually, yeah, so at the beginning it was a FTP website and only in 1994 it started to, to become a worldwide web uh, um, a website type. And then in 2013, a bio archive was launched, which I think it's an important uh, uh, concept. I know that there have been many other archives, uh, uh, but in, uh, uh, in this case, uh, I think it also explains how different communities can easily learn uh, uh, this uh, uh, very uh, somehow like it, it's a it's a very handy concept for researchers it's very handy for them to be able to share article and read them freely so even uh, areas where there is a little bit of pushback uh, because of cultural reasons it actually um, wins always so uh, this uh, this is the history of archives. So, but what happened in 2020? I think that 2020 is going to be another year that we are going to put in the um, in the chronology of archive history. So, in March is actually also the same uh, month when I started uh, working on archive. Uh, and as soon as I joined, uh, what happened was that uh, we started to see this uh, um, increase, uh, this uh, kind of really steep increase in submissions uh, in uh, COVID related papers. And they were, uh, so we have a, a, um, a section that is relatively small of quantitative biology, but in reality, COVID related papers started to be submitted in uh, uh, almost all our uh, fields from physics, statistics, computer science, uh, um, more uh, sociology, all different aspects. So this uh, really, uh, because we are not bio archive, uh, we are archive, uh, uh, we are very used to deal with the articles about cosmology or, mathem or mathematics, uh, but something that has uh, this uh, direct uh, and very quick effect on the society. It's something that is a little bit new for us. And so it was really an opportunity to learn how to deal with this. So one first thing that we observed is that we needed to be part of it. The archive plays a very key role uh, together with the other uh, preprint servers uh, in uh, research. And, uh, and COVID really highlighted this, not just uh, for ourselves, but also for the public. Uh, articles that uh, were um, uh, on the New York Times, Nature, many other uh, general uh, newspapers uh, showed how the, the speed in which uh, uh, preprint servers allow article to go online and be read by others is key for advancing research at the pace that is needed while you are uh, fighting a global pandemic and you are trying to, to learn about uh, um, the virus and so on while it is happening. Uh, yet, uh, this also shows that the, the fear for, of um, misleading information is an extremely important concern that needs to be addressed because uh, if it's true that you need to have all this uh, uh, information shared quickly, it is also true that you need to have some kind of sense of what you can trust and how to interpret what you're reading. So how to fit this uh, in the way that archive works? So, so archive right now um, uh, and, and right now and in the last 30 years has worked uh, uh, in this uh, uh, with this kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, workflow. We, we start with the author submitting their article, uh, and then we have uh, a pool of moderators that uh, uh, work together with uh, uh, automated systems to check the submission for basic quality, and they have less than 24 hours uh, uh, time to do this check. So this means that uh, uh, moderators need to spread all over the planet in different time zones, uh, uh, and sometimes it's even less, considerably less than 24 hours, can be uh, up to six hours uh, if uh, the paper is submitting at the last moment. Um, and then as soon as, they, as the, the basic quality control has happened, uh, uh, papers happen, uh, appear online at 8 p.m. Eastern time, so New York time. Um, so the, the basic quality control is nothing close to peer review, of course, uh, but it's more about uh, 
in for physics you know it's something that is more about do we have all the metadata is the information uh, complete is the article readable is it uh, structured in the form of a proper scientific paper um so this is the kind of uh, level that uh, usually it's uh, considered uh, and then as soon as they appear online uh, we continue sending emails to all the subscribers in the same way that joanna did it uh, 30 years ago and uh, uh, it's a, one of the ways uh, if not the way in which the majority of our users uh, uh, um, receive uh, archive uh, information and then uh, i think there is a, a wall different uh, uh, circle of uh, information that is happening outside archive so conversations uh, among colleagues uh, social media uh, publications uh, in uh, peer reviewed journals and so on everything uh, somehow comes together to create uh, uh, new research so the way I, we see archive is really not uh, as a standalone way to, to share research, but it's part of the uh, broader ecosystem. So it was important for us uh, to make sure that uh, we would have, uh, uh, we would be able to address the concerns and at the same time leverage the importance of preprints uh, uh, during this pandemic. So a few of the actions we took uh, is to, create a link on the home page uh, to highlight the COVID related papers, both on archive, med archive and bio archive, and also specify that these are not peer reviewed uh, papers. So uh, every reader should uh, take the precautions so that they uh, consider uh, opportune for this uh, type of reading. Uh, and then we also do that, we repeat the same type of uh, disclaimer also uh, for every single paper on the record page of every single paper that, has, uh, that is related to COVID. And then on top of that, what we realized is that we needed a specialized moderator. So that was something that initially we had to act uh, really in urgency uh, because we were receiving from zero one day, the next week, we received more than 100 papers that were related to COVID. And at the beginning, it was growing exponentially. So the, the moderators that we had that had an expertise that was uh, right for this type of uh, articles uh, were not enough. So we had to have someone that would focus on that, uh, regardless of the category, just check COVID-related papers. So. Um, and the main task would be mostly to ensure that the articles were not dangerous for public consumption. So it was not a peer review. It doesn't say that the content of the article is necessarily right or high level, but at least uh, that we would have a level of um, confidence in uh, having this article publicly available online. Uh, so we initially had a, a six month contract with the COVID moderators, but and after the, the six months ended, uh, we realized that the number of submission was really not decreasing. It stopped increasing, but it's kind of plateau. So we, we still needed to have someone uh, with that expertise. So we are now at our second COVID moderator uh, that is working with us and they, uh, yeah, they will be staying with us until it's needed. Um, and then like 2020 has brought many changes to archive. So I think that the fact that it happened during the pandemic made everything a little bit more extreme, but there, there were big changes anyway in the pipeline. Uh, one was that I was hired. So it was the first executive director position created for archive. And in coincidence with that, we also moved the headquarters from the Cornell Library to Cornell Tech in, uh, in New York City. Um, and then we, uh, we had to learn on the fly how to deal with the COVID related papers. Uh, and also uh, my team had to deal how to uh, learn how to deal with a new executive director uh, without uh, uh, meeting me. Most of, uh, uh, most of the people that I work with, uh, uh, we, we still haven't really met in person. So th that has been a, a big change and it also made us realize the importance of remote work. Uh, that's something we were already doing in archive, but uh, 
it's different when you cannot uh, uh, travel, you cannot meet with each other even if you want to. So, uh, and then and the other thing that uh, we uh, had to, re to come to term with is to develop a new sustainability model. This is uh, both because of uh, um, constraints on the budget uh, due to the pandemic, but also because uh, our previous uh, model was based on downloads. Uh, and of course, uh, downloads uh, during a time where everyone was working from home was uh, much harder to track. So most of the lessons we learned through 2020 are not the COVID specifics, are something that uh, in fact uh, are things that we might have needed to address maybe even earlier, but COVID really uh, like made highlighted the importance of ACT quickly. Uh, so in, uh, in 2020, we, uh, we worked hard to achieve uh, several things. One was uh, releasing the new Tech Live update. This was something that was uh, uh, requ requested uh, very vocally from our community. And in uh, um, connection to it, uh, we also improved uh, tech error highlighting for authors. So when they submit and their paper doesn't compile properly, uh, they have a better context uh, around it uh, so that it will make it uh, easier for them to understand uh, uh, how to correct it. Oh, we didn't release uh, Tech Live twice. I just uh, <laughs> made a mistake here. Uh, but then another thing that we've been working on is uh, uh, re-architecturing the entire um, archive website. Uh, and in that uh, context, uh, also moving most of the services uh, to the cloud. So that is already the case uh, that about 80% of what you experience in archive uh, is actually happening on the cloud. Um, and we are looking for a complete uh, move by the end of the year. We also became a data site member, uh, which is uh, an important uh, uh, consideration because this means that we will start uh, um, registering DOIs for archive records. We will also keep uh, uh, the archive IDs. This is uh, the archive IDs uh, is something that has served us uh, very, very well in the last 30 years. Uh, it's a very unique, uh, very easy to build a URL through it. Uh, it's very easy to handle versioning with it. Uh, so um, it's, uh, it's, it's very good uh, to, to keep it. On the other hand, uh, it is important for archive to become part uh, more officially of the uh, of the community, of the scholarly communication community. So a better integration using DOIs, I think uh, would be a good thing. We also launched uh, a new archive branding, including a new logo uh, that you can see here at the corner, uh, colors, uh, guidelines for use. And while this seems uh, sometimes cosmetic, uh, it is also important because uh, uh, it, it allows us to collaborate better with others, uh, both in the use of APIs, uh, both in the uh, use of uh, overlay journals, uh, um, uh, Google Scholar, uh, Inspire, NASA ADS, all the other services uh, that rely on archive uh, content uh, have a better streamlined way to show what is archive, what is a different source. Uh, and so on. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very good way to communicate our identity to, to our users. And uh, um, another, and, and related to this is that we launched uh, what we call Archive Labs, which is a framework for community collaboration. So other organizations or even individuals uh, that have ideas to develop something that could uh, improve the experience of archive users, they are welcome to do that. And uh, we, we, with that, we launched, for example, linking between uh, archive records uh, and underlying software and data. We have better ways uh, for recommending articles. We have better ways for exploring the bibliography of, uh, of each ar ar article. So yeah, there is a lot of potential there. And then finally, uh, we are also trying to so the, uh, surfacing the classification algorithm was the first uh, step, but we are really looking to uh, become more transparent with our authors uh, in, uh, in how it, uh, uh, in how archive works and how we interpret the use of categories, how we interpret uh, uh, the role that we have in the community. 
Uh, last uh, news is that uh, just uh, this month uh, we released uh, a new moderation tool. So this is uh, something that allows uh, uh, our moderators to collaborate with each other remotely. Uh, so everyone can see if another moderator has already checked the paper, you don't need to check it anymore. Uh, and we have a better way for them to communicate uh, when they needed to discuss a paper and they are not sure what to do with it. So this is a, this was an internal uh, service, but I think that it will also help uh, our readers to and our authors especially to have a more streamlined experience and more um, like fast type of uh, response. Uh, and then finally, the uh, new sustainability model, as I mentioned before, it is now based on submissions and not downloads, uh, um, because uh, we uh, think that this represents better the impact that archive has uh, for, each, uh, uh, for each institution. Uh, institutions are, are members, so university, lab, libraries, labs, uh, any, any kind of research organization uh, is a mem could be a member. And, on, uh, and, and their uh, tier, let's say, is based on submission. But we also have two added levels that we call champion and community. Champion is for those that really believe in archive and want, want to contribute above uh, uh, their tier. And community is for those that maybe don't submit uh, much to archive, but they are using it for reading, or maybe that uh, they are smaller universities or from uh, uh, countries with less uh, um, agency. And so they, um, they still want to be part of the community, was still want to be part of archive governance, but they, don't, uh, uh, they are not able to contribute at the same level. And then we created the two new programs. So one is affiliates that is focused on nonprofit organizations like professional societies, government agencies, and so on, uh, and sponsors, which are actual companies that uh, interact with archive. Uh, Google with the Google Scholar is one of them, but there are many. Uh, and, um, and so with this, uh, we are really hoping to ensure a long-term sustainability for archive. And then what will come next? So the, for the rest of the year, really our higher focus is to uh, work on a, on a new well-structured flexible metadata schema for all archive records. This will allow us to uh, register DOIs for all our records, capture ORCID and ROR uh, information at the record level. Uh, add the uh, ability to add funding information, and we, this is uh, important for the compliance. Sorry, I made a, a typo with ERC requirements and Plan S. Uh, and that uh, will also be part of the complete migration to a new architecture uh, that will make uh, uh, interoperability much easier. And that is all from me. This is my email. Uh, you can follow me, or you can follow Archive on Twitter, or read the news on our blog. Thanks so much, Eleonora. That was a, a really comprehensive overview of archives. Um, uh, we'll get into uh, questions in a second and pop those in the Q&A if you have them. Um, I will just say that uh, starting in two minutes, um, there's a networking session in Wonder, and there's directions for how to do that in SCED. Um, that's a great uh, place to have um, informal conversations, catch up with each other, talk about the ideas challenge, visit with our sponsors. Um, you know, I wish we could offer you some hors d'oeuvres and a beverage to go along with it, um, depending on your time zone. Uh, and hopefully uh, we'll, be, we'll be set up to do that next year in Denver again. Um, but for now, Wonder is a great place to chat. Um, Eleonora, the question from Ann Lawrence is, um, uh, you know, you talked about how how the quality checkers are. You have more infrastructure for for letting quality checkers communicate between themselves. Um, do you have a, any plan for um, communicating with the submitter about why they did or didn't pass the quality check? Is that information transparent? Yeah. So this is something that is. Uh that we are working on to improve. So we do have uh, um, uh, author support uh, uh, team. So they are the ones that uh, facilitate the communication with authors. Um, but 
oftentimes it's difficult to, to uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, so the, 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 statistically it's very unlikely that a paper is not uh, accepted on archive. Uh, we have uh, maybe, I don't know, 1% of the articles that are not accepted. But when that happens, of course, the authors uh, feels very strongly about it. Uh, and so it's important to, to communicate well, but at the same time, um, there is often not uh, uh, an answer that will make the author happy. Uh, so what, what I am hoping to do is to really try to, to explain, to make a little bit more transparent uh, the criteria that we are using, um, but they are always open for interpretation. So it's always uh, um, a little bit of a, um, of a challenge uh, to, to, to do this kind of, uh, to be as transparent as one would want. Uh. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, have it, so now we built the system for moderators. We are building a similar system for internal administrators that will communicate with each other. And so once that this flow of information is going to be more streamlined, I believe uh, that it will also be much more easier and transparent for authors. Yeah, that's a that's a huge challenge. Um, uh, and you know, any any work you make in that direction is probably is positive and sounds very challenging. Um, our next question is, um, uh, Anna says, um, it's a great, a very good presentation. Um, congratulations for your many changes. Uh, you're going in the right direction. Um, the question is, as Spire Archive and other archives are mushrooming, do you consider expanding the sector you cover? Um, you know the sectors of archive or um do you plan to stay with with what you have yeah that's a very good question um right now we are actually uh considering an expansion towards engineering uh, mostly because uh, we are already receiving a lot of papers uh, that are like computational engineering and right now it's uh, uh, to go back to the previous question is the area that uh, creates the most problems with communicating with authors because uh, it's not that their paper is not good it's just that uh, it doesn't really fit in any of archive categories and so we don't really know what to do with it and and this uh, uh and, and so at the moment we are a little bit more reactive than proactive in the expansion so when we see that there is the need that we do it but we really also wanted to work as closely as possible with other archives to make sure that uh, there is a yeah, like yeah, that is clear for authors uh, where one starts and the other begin and, and, and so on. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I had a question. Uh, you said that you have a content moderator for COVID. Do you have uh, plans for other content moderators like that? So we actually have a moderator. So we have between one or one and three moderators already for each single category. Okay. But the problem with COVID was that the papers were spread all over and that we didn't really have the right expertise for this type of paper. So that's why we had an extra one. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Um, any other questions? Um, Eleonora, her information is uh, here and uh, I'm sure would be happy to answer them. Um, and then I encourage you all to, um, to head to, to wonder for, uh, for the networking session. And, um, and then we'll see you for more presentations tomorrow. So thanks so much um, to all our presenters um, and for all the great questions. Thank you.